This sermon, I guess, is for those who may feel a little weary this morning, a little put upon, for those who feel they've got too much to do and feel like they may not have the energy to do it. For some of us who used to do things a lot faster than we do now, although the same stuff has to be done that we had to do then. We just do it slower. In other words, the sermon today is basically for me. I was winding the old clock in my living room uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm impressed how somebody in 16... Uh, 45, I think it was, somewhere around there, I was just a kid, had the idea of uh, (laughs) of putting a weight uh, on a a chain and uh, invented the pendulum so that the clock would run My clock in my living room is not plugged in. It has not been plugged in in the last 250 years, and yet it still runs. And it keeps pretty good time. It loses about three minutes a week. I could fix that, but it's a delicate operation, and what the heck. When I set it, I just run it forward three minutes. That's pretty good for a clock that's 250 years old. But what impresses me is is the guy, I assume it was a guy, who figured this out. A clock runs by capturing the power of a falling weight. Because when you hold a piece of lead weight up and you drop it, it goes straight to the ground. And that falling motion, that, that creates energy, and he harnessed the energy of those falling weights. One weight on one side runs the time business, and the weight on the other side runs the striking mechanism so it can count out the hours. And unless the clock breaks, that's always going to work, but what, because what is driving that clock is gravity. And if gravity doesn't hold, children, we are in big trouble. You can count on it pretty much. When I wind that baby up and those weights start down again with that pendulum swinging, controlling the whole thing, that clock's going to move and it's going to tell me the time. Power. (laughs) <laughs> we had a lovely lady here once. She's passed on, and I loved her dearly. She had been here for a while, but uh, she didn't seem that she was getting success and in getting involved in anything. I remember she came into the kitchen one time when some of the women were working around here, and she put her hands on her hips, and she said, I want some power around here. She had worked in an office, and she had had several women under her, and she came to church, and nobody was under her. She wanted some power around here. We all need power. What we don't all realize is that we actually don't have any power that belongs to us. It's not ours. We don't belong to us. The power that keeps us going doesn't belong to us. In God, we live and move and have our being. It's all his power, and he lets us use it. And there's more of God's power that is available to us than we generally know. (laughs) We have the one who runs the whole thing. And by the whole thing, I don't mean Texas and Oklahoma. I mean the universe. I mean all this beyond this universe in eternity. And this power (laughs) is on our side. 
This power is the one we belong to. This power loves us even at our worst. Bob Dylan wrote a song once. Well, he wrote a lot of songs once. But this one's called Love Minus Zero Dash. I think I put the dash in there. Could be a comma. Love Minus Zero no limit. Or it may should be an equal sign. Love minus zero equals no limit. No limit to the love. That's the kind of love God has for us. No limit. And there are a lot of times I think when God is waiting to help us and waiting to help us and waiting to help us and sometimes God is the last one that we call on for, for help. A lady called me recently, and Lord have mercy, her life is in a mess. And she cried all the way through the conversation. I, I, didn't, I didn't know her. In fact, I didn't even know her name until halfway through the conversation. I thought to ask her what her name was, and she told me. She said she's always doing that talking to people and not telling them who she is. She's a, she listed off five emotional and mental illnesses that she has. I probably have some too. I just don't have names on them. She's got that uh, uh, compulsive disorder. She has that. She says she's sorry she didn't get the compulsive cleaning disorder. Hers is a compulsive junking disorder. She's having to move. She's embarrassed because she's a hoarder. And her kitchen floor is piled high. Said her mama told her never to throw anything down outside, but mama never said anything about inside. So she gets through with it, it hits the floor. She says she has 20 lids to jars on a table right in front of her, and she has no jars that go on. Why is she keeping them? She's cleaning out her refrigerator. She said, you have no idea. I said, well, I may have some idea. <laughs> she says she just can't get it together. She had read one of my little articles somewhere. I, I don't think she takes the paper, but those things just kind of wander around, and sometimes they hit somebody in their life. And she had read it, and that's why she called me. She looked up my number somehow. She got my number. We talked, we talked for a good while. I finally told her I wanted to tell her a story. And I told her the story of Mary Carr. Now, you probably know the story of Mary Carr because it's in the little book, and I've shared it several times in sermons. But it's, it's pretty important. Um, Mary Carr was an atheist and had no interest in God. And her problem was she was an alcoholic. And she had tried everything to beat it. She had a 12-year-old son named Dev. And uh, she was not being the mother that she ought to be because she was drinking too much. And so she was desperate. A friend of hers finally told her, said to her, why don't you try prayer? Which is a funny thing to say to somebody that doesn't believe in God. And she thought it was a funny thing for somebody to say to somebody who doesn't even believe in God because who are you praying to if you don't believe in God? And, but she was so desperate, she decided to try prayer. And um, she was not... Um, she didn't know anything eloquent to say. In fact, she had a she had a she had a two-word prayer, and she prayed it every morning. Help me. That's it. Help me. And then at the end of the day, if she stayed sober, she had a one-word prayer. Thanks. She did this every day. And she found out that she was staying sober more often, and then she was staying sober all the time, 
And then she said, for some reason, when she prayed that prayer, something started happening somewhere down in her chest that felt like it was around her heart. And she didn't know what that was. Then her son Dev said to her out of the blue one day, Mama, why don't we go to church? And after all of this transformation in her life, which had already taken place, she had let the booze go. Uh, she said, okay. And they went to church. And uh, she joined the church. And she became a Christian. Mary Carr, the author of a fairly raucous book called Liar's Club, became a Christian. <laughs> and it all started with, help me and thanks. It's not like taking an aspirin and two hours later you get, you know, your headache's gone. It's not like that. It's like a relationship. I've got some things I want to do in life, and I think, uh, I think I've got a lot of things I want to do, and I want to do a lot of things differently from the way I'm doing them, and I, I think, how, how can I possibly get all of that done? You see me whizzing around here, don't you? Well, let's change that whiz to... Uh, You see me crawling around here, whatever you do when you're standing up straight and moving slowly. How can I get all of that done? I don't think I've got the, the energy. I don't think it's possible. But I know what I want to do. After I told that woman that, about Mary Carr, I said, listen. Think about what you want to get done. She had movers coming the next day who were going to move her to a new apartment. I said, let this be a new beginning. Think about how you want to live, not the way you are living, and think about where you want to get. And she said, I just don't think I can get there. I said, no, I don't think you can either. I don't know that I can get done the things I need to, I would like to get done like in the next Three months? I don't think I can do that. I probably can't, but there is a source of power available to us that can get us from where we are to where we need to be if we just say at the beginning of each day, Lord, work with me or help. But then during the day, you've got to remember that you prayed that prayer and you have engaged this power which can lead you where you need to go beyond whatever you expect you may be able to do. The scripture says far more abundantly than you and I can even receive, conceive because this power is on our side. And if you really need to get it done, then you really need, and I really need, to tap into that power and get the things done that we used to do. You remember the guy on the radio who used to have a joking advertisement about powder milk biscuits? Powder milk biscuits, Garrison Keeler. Powder milk biscuits that could make you get up in the morning and do the things you need to do? Well, that's what the power of God can do for us. Can I tell you another old story, if you don't mind? It's also in the book. Uh, but it comes to me occasionally. I spoke over at a, uh, uh, a retirement facility not far from here last week, and they have one of those gates that opens up. I'm very familiar with that gate because Riley and Phyllis Yorth used to be over there. Bill Williams used to be over there. Several other people used to be over there. They've now passed away. And um, by the way, speaking of uh, Raleigh and Phyllis and their son Edward, I do need to tell you that Edward's son David came through his surgery Friday 
on just fine. He had heart surgery, had th three arteries blocked, and we give, we give thanks for that. Anyway, as I was driving through that gate, I remembered the story that I had told years ago. Uh, they had the same kind of gate over at a place in Dallas called the United Methodist Reporter, and they used to provide the front page of the paper to local churches, and we would, we would have, a, uh, like the front of a small newspaper would be our newsletter, and they gave that, made that available to all of the different churches, United Methodist Reporter. And uh, it's, it's where Wally Bennett used to, be, used to work. He used to be the editor. That's Carol uh, Bennett's uh, husband, who has passed away, Reverend Wally Bennett. Well, anyway, uh, it's one of those gates where you drive up to and then uh, you push a button or something and it opens for you. But here you didn't even have to push a button. You drove up to it and uh, it broke this beam and it allowed you to come through the gate and then the gate would close behind you. Now, I was always in a hurry and I didn't want to have to look for a parking place and there were parking places always available at the, around at the side of the building. And I would pull around there, where most people didn't park, and I would park, and I would rush in and give the copy for the week for our church newsletter and put it on the secretary's desk, and then I would go back out and get in my car, and I would come back to the gate, and for some reason, um, it, it would never open for me when I was leaving. It just would not open. And uh, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't know why. It was a puzzle. I thought, well, I'm not getting close enough for it to break that beam so that it will open. So I would pull up, almost bumping into the gate. I'm surprised I didn't crash through it. And still the gate would not open. It would not move. So one day I decided maybe I need to come at it from the side because I noticed other cars that drove up from my right would come up and the gate would just, it would just open for them. I thought, that's what I need to do. You have to approach this baby just right. So I got to where I would get in my car, I would come into that front parking lot and turn around, and I would approach it catty corner, angled into the gate, so that when I got to the gate, the gate opened every single time, and I was so proud of myself because it was pretty clever. This thing thought it was smarter than I was, but turns out, twerk so. I could now do it. And you know, when you're proud of yourself, you just have to brag. I went into the secretary at the front gate the next week after I had discovered this marvelous thing. And I said, you know, I've got to brag on myself just a little bit. I said, I have discovered that I have, I have conquered that gate. I have discovered that I can open the gate if I come at it from the far right. I said, it opens every time. And I said, I can do it now. She said, no, you can't. <laughs> well, I didn't know what that answer meant because I could. And I told her, I said, yes. I can do it now every time. I said, I've tried it for a couple of weeks now. It, it had worked perfectly. I just come at it from the right. She said, no, you can't. I said, what do you mean? She said, that gate is controlled by a button here on my desk. <laughs> and the only reason that gate opens for you is because when you pull around to the right from the normal parking lot, I can see you, and I open the gate for you. Well, this not only squelched my pride, it made me feel like an idiot. But I knew that after that, I had no power over the gate, but she did. She ran it. There's someone who loves us, who has the power that you and I need for living. And if it's not going right now, if it's not the way we want to do things, this power is available to you and to me. Again, as the scripture says, far more abundantly than 
we can imagine. Well, in three or four months, I'll report and tell you whether I've gotten everything done that I need to get done in the next three or four months. I may not, but I'll have this comfort of knowing that every morning when I get up and I'm going to do this and say, Lord, be with me through this day. Give me what I need to do the work I need to do. I know that God is doing that. And if I don't get it done, well, maybe I didn't have to get it done after all. Join me in prayer. Lord, we are thankful. We're not here by ourselves. We're here with you and you're here with us. And you are the source of not just our power, but our very existence. And you have an investment in us. And we know that you do not plan to lose that investment. So work with us, work through us, work on us, and do the work that you need to do in the world through us. In Jesus' name, amen.